Happy Monday, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Two Chaps Many Cultures, episode 146. And today we'll talk yet again, as we have done so before on this program, about diversity. Not necessarily diversity in the workplace, where you as an adult, get introduced to a topic that may or may not be new to you, maybe, maybe we should be starting talking about diversity and inclusiveness at a much earlier stage in our lives. And we have somebody who knows a thing or two about this. Stay tuned. Welcome, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing. I'm doing. I'm doing pretty good. Absolutely. Digging a uh, weekend of digging out of uh, piles and piles of snow. But um, that's, a, that's a, you know, typical, typical of Chicago. So the, those of you who live in sunnier climates snow that's a form of frozen water that descends <laughs> from the heavens and accumulates on top of humanity. And people in the Midwest really, really like it a lot. That's why they get a lot of it. Right, Brett? Absolutely. It's like my natural habitat as, a, as an Australian. Where, where right. else could I possibly feel any more at home? <laughs> there we go. And feeling at home, even though you may not necessarily are, you may not necessarily be familiar with your surroundings at first, but how do you feel at home if your home isn't like everybody else's home or if the people that live in your home don't look like the people outside of your home, how do you feel like you belong? We talked about this last week on Friday with Alan and the belonging part, the uh, feeling that I am a part of my environment regardless of the way I look or who I pray to or what I eat and the language I speak. Um, the, that part of belonging begins, with that, that search for or meaning making of identity begins at a very early age. So why, one might ask, are we only talking about this at an adult stage of our lives, maybe in the workplace when there is a diversity hiccup or something? Wouldn't it be smart, one might ask, to address these questions a little early in life? Brett, how would you feel about that? I would feel very good about that if we could do that. That would take out a lot of, uh, you would think it would take out a lot of work, probably put a lot of people out of work, actually. Even that, this is one of those cases where it would be good if we could put diversity and inclusion practice out of work um, when it finally got to the workplace. But it, we, it's sorely needed. But, you know, if we can, if we can actually um, embed this early on, absolutely. This would, this would uh, save, a lot of, save a lot of friction, I think, yeah. Wouldn't it be smart to include people that know a thing or two about early childhood development? Well, you know us. We need we need to learn. <laughs> right. Well, let 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 let's cut to the chase. We have somebody who does exactly that. And we want to welcome all the way from Bengaluru, India, our dear friend Akila Daspla. And I'm hoping I pronounced your name properly. So Akila, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Christian. I'm so glad to be here. And how do you say your name? Akila Dasbla. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a hard k sound that resonates in the throat. Akila. Yes. All, right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you are based in Bengaluru, which means it's already late in the day for you. So good evening to you. Well, it is a good morning to us. And is that where you're originally from? Um, yes, actually, that is where I'm originally from. But um, my father was in the defense, and so we kind of traveled all over India. So um, it, it's hard to call any one place home. But yeah, Bangalore is where the roots are. So you and a business partner have developed a product or a, 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 a suite of products or a growing suite of products that allow us to address the diversity topic. At, at a childhood age. So 
let's start at the beginning. What is it you do and how is it different from exposing children to diversity uh, that, that you've seen before you came up with your idea? Um, so basically what we do is, uh, so I uh, am basically a co-founder at Indigro, uh, and we create multicultural books and games and songs um, to children all over the world. Uh, we've started with uh, India because it's the largest diaspora. We've moved on to Singapore, and we have plans for other cultures uh, in play as well. Uh, the idea being that we want to kind of introduce conversations of diversity and inclusion at an early stage because mm -hmm. The uh, conversations um, help children make sense of the world around them. Uh, children as early as two years of age can kind of notice uh, differences in cult uh, culture. They notice differences in race. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, it's something that they're used to um, kind of notice and observe. And a lot of the times what happens with parents is that we kind of shush these conversations because children are curious by nature. Like, why is this different? Why is this happening like this? Why is that person talking so weirdly? Why is that person looking different? And we, you know, we're like, no, no, that's our polite. Don't say that. Mm -hmm. Don't talk like yeah. that. And we, we kind of shush children. And what we're trying to say is that children are naturally curious. And when they're naturally curious and you provide opportunity for them to explore that curiosity to kind of make connections based on the similarities that they see in other people and also teach them about accepting the differences that they see in other people through the language that they know best which is play mm -hmm. automatically what you're doing is you're raising kind and empathetic children and what the world needs today is kind and empathetic people and I couldn't that's agree more our <laughs> philosophy of what we're trying to do so yeah. Let, let, let me rewind your story then a little bit more. What prompted you specifically to get involved in that topic? Did you ever experience this being hushed up or did somebody else hush up your children? I don't know, what, what, what prompted this? So uh, it's quite interesting actually because, uh, so my co-founder and I, um, so Shama, um, we're, we're friends, we've been friends for 20 years. We were in college together. Um, we've kind of uh, almost grown up together in that sense. And um, I've had a background in early childhood education and worked with children all my life. And around the time that she was pregnant, which is about three, four years ago now, um, she, of course, I traveled the world and uh, she ended up being in Singapore, married to a South African, raising this half Indian, half South African child in Singapore. And at the time that she was, re you know, she was pregnant, she was thinking about how do I introduce my culture, my roots to this child who is obviously growing up in a multicultural environment. He's, you know, growing up in a multicultural household. And while, um, you know, she wanted to introduce India to him she but she also wanted to introduce it in a way that was contemporary that was global because she was raising a global child and this is something that I had dealt with as well when we were when I was teaching and uh, I was working with children and we we're looking at all the educative material that was out there even for Indian children in India right you'd, you'd find a lot of the context was not cultural it was always mm -hmm. out of context so indian children in india themselves were growing up with context that was you know educational books that you know would have a blonde and a blue eyed child you know talking about something and we were like there has to be a way in which we can introduce culture to children that allows them the to be able to look at themselves in the mirror and say hey that's me and recognize that at the same time create content out there for children to look at other other children growing up across the world and say okay that's what it's like and you know my skin might be a different color and we may eat different food and we may speak different languages but we both like to play ball and to kind of find those similarities and connect that and so she asked me to come on board and i jumped at the idea and that's where we started and we started with indigo uh, with indigo with the indian collection and then we've moved on to singapore now we've just released our singapore collection uh, singapore as you know is a melting pot of uh, different cultures across the world and yeah and now we're just spreading culture by culture and um, that's the idea for us going forward nice 
Do we have the um, – my, my daughter goes to a school here which is really, really diverse here in Chicago. It's actually – I you know, I don't know much about the outside of the school system here, but we we just landed very luckily in an area that has a great deal of diversity, both uh, Korean and uh, African-American, Mexican uh, predominantly, um, things like that. So there are multiple languages spoken at the school. And um, so do you – uh, and and also styles of learning. So, as an early childhood professional, do do you feel that the, it's important for teachers also to understand, as well as parents, the different styles their students might be learning as from their cultural background? Or and so by osmosis, uh, they're they're playing differently. Are they they playing differently even from those perspectives? Absolutely. I think that your culture plays such a big role in terms of how you think, how you be, uh, kind of uh, absorb the environment, right? And um, I think that what happens with children is that you, they're, they're, what you uh, kind of notice around you, um, obviously you have what we call your obvious interactions and um, what comes to the forefront, what people are clearly telling you, but that what you also absorb is the unconscious bias, right? You absorb the unconscious uh, messaging or mm. the subconscious messaging that is all around you all the time. And it's simple things, right? Like at an, at an early childhood level, now say for example, I'm a child who eats yellow rice and I take it to school, but in an environment where children have never come across yellow rice before, somebody's going to point that out and say, you, why is your mm. rice yellow? Mm -hmm. Automatically at a two and a half, three year old age, I'm suddenly looking at my rice and saying, okay, there's something wrong here. There's something wrong about what my food is. And this is something that actually brings me great joy and comfort. It's something that makes me happy, but I very quickly learn that it's something that I need to leave at home. It is not mm -hmm. something I can share with the world. Mm -hmm. And that uh, way, yeah. you know, and, and, and that's, a, that's something really powerful for a three or four year old have to deal with. It or, happened to Brett when he took his Vegemite sandwich to um, to, to the park in, in Chicago the other day and people looked at him and said, Woo, what is this? This is weird. Well, my daughter took Vegemite to school when she was <laughs> a, right? We 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 she would take a Vegemite sandwich to school and it became this point of my goodness. I mean it, and I don't know, is that the right thing to do? I'm I'm thinking Wow, I'm going to let my daughter take something that's ostensibly going to be really offensive to the rest of her little friends. <laughs> it's a, it, it's really a, a very much an acquired taste. I guess I don't remember her ever expressing that there was any pushback, but there probably was. You know, there probably like, how can you eat this? I mean, it's it's really it terrible. Doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be the food itself. I remember right. when our kids went to school, my we we packed lunches for our kids, um, and the way we in Germany pack the lunch is a we learned quickly was different than most American kids brought their lunches to school. And my daughters came home and said, well, they were laughing about, or they were asking questions. They weren't laughing. They were asking questions about this container that was in. And mm. why, why do you get this type of food? So this, this is an experience that children who don't follow the quote unquote mainstream culture of where they grew up will be exposed to, right? So how, how are your books or other products that IndieGrow is developing? How are they addressing this? So tell, tell us about what, what, what IndieGrow does differently. So, so for us, firstly, the one thing is that culture can be very intimidating, right? Across the board, you know, whether whether you're a child or an adult, uh, any kind of culture, and especially in today's day and age where, you know, we're also kind of careful about stepping on somebody's toes. We, we're, we're worried about saying the wrong thing, we're about you know, eating the, in the wrong way, uh, wearing the wrong clothes and things like that. And any kind of culture, uh, when you don't know enough about it, you, you worry that I'm, I'm gonna say the wrong thing. And because human nature, we're so worried about uh, making a faux pas, we step back and we completely say, you know, I'd rather not deal with that than make a mistake. Mm -hmm. and, what, and what we're trying to say is that 
you know, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to uh, let's have that conversation. And the best way for children to connect is through play. So we create games, we create stories. So the idea being that now, say, for example, if I were to take the Indian culture, for example, it's it's it can be intimidating to most people. It's intimidating to most Indians, right? I mean, if I'm if I'm not cultural in the traditional sense, you know, I'm worried that I might you know, anger some auntie who considers herself to be extremely cultural, right? So the point being that how do we break it down? How do you make it relatable? How do you make it inclusive? So when you do, when you put it in the form of games, I, as a child, three-year-old, I have a friend who comes over. We play the game. The cultural context is different. It's a memory game. So every child across the world knows how to play memory. It's just matching two cards. But when you see the autos, you see a Kathakali dancer, or you see, uh, say, an Indian wedding on one of those cards, mm. automatically the associations start to form. It's visual. Mm. But I don't need somebody to break it down. It's not a lecture. We're not talking about diversity. We're not saying that, oh, this is what you need to learn about India. And this is how Indians are. It just is. It's part of your play. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, what we're saying is that you can't have diversity sitting on a shelf in a bookstore anymore. It needs to be mm-hmm. part of your everyday life. And it needs to go beyond take out on Sunday evenings, right? Mm-hmm. It, it, you can't, you know, I find that a lot of the people, they'll say, oh, you know, but we're so diverse. We ordered Korean food the other day and my children love Korean food. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, you know, yes, Korean barbecues and sushi and Indian curry. Yes, that's a good step in the right direction. But I think you need to go a bit more. It needs to be part of your everyday life. It needs, you know, bring in the puzzles, bring in the games, bring in the songs, bring in the books and make, you know, today pizza and pasta are everyday words in any household across the world. Why? It started somewhere. Right. right? Mm. It's because it got culturally integrated. And I think that when we start to make culture part of play, everyday play, that's when the impact happens. And that's when it becomes part of their world. And okay. that's what we- So I've got an important question here. As an Indian, you would relate to this. And not, there is hope that everybody will play cricket on the face of the planet if we embed it early into early childhood. I believe it's possible, Akila. Thank you. <laughs> Well, the U.S. has a cricket team, so there's hope. Yeah. <laughs> there, there, there is, yes. But, you know, I play cricket here, but it, it's uh, people you see when you're playing cricket here in the summertime that uh, the, 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 it's in neighbourhoods and people are doing their jogging and they, they're jogging looking, what are these crazy people doing out there in the middle of the field? This is not a game I know. So anyway, I'm just, I'm I dig- I digress, but yeah, <laughs> so I, it's, it's it has been Brett's mission to impart <laughs> cricket somehow in as many episodes as possible. So well done, sir. So is is this something? Is Indigo solving a problem in let's say first of all in India where you live? Um, because traditionally there haven't been early childhood education products to support this cause. I, I'm, I'm trying to draw a parallel here to North America when, I don't know, in the it was probably in the 1980s or 1990s when the manufacturers of dolls, one particular brand that is very popular in North America, um, all of a sudden um, pr- started producing dolls with different skin tones and different hair colors and even different body types. But that was a very slow, slow process. Um, so the 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 white majority ethnicity slash culture in the U.S. was um, perpetuated, or it, it's it's perceived supremacy, and I'm putting that in quotation marks, was being perpetuated by the play products that were available to to families and children, and it took a long time to to break up those uh those stereotypes in, in in the form of what's available for parents and, and and children is that is that something where you see india is still a few steps behind that there is so much still colonial remnants of what 
educational materials should be like that you're, you're beginning to break this up or am I misreading this? No, so I think the there there is stuff in india that is coming out nowadays uh that is that has indian cultural context uh mm -hmm. there are a lot of publishers that are doing really good work in india in creating content um that is specific to uh the indian narrative but i think that uh, what we found that was lacking, especially for the dias Indian diaspora market, especially, was that there's a lot of um, focus on language. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of focus on religion. Uh, and even within India, there, there's a lot of the old folklore that tends to kind of come into play. But there was nothing that kind of made it contemporary, made it global for today's child. The other thing was this idea of connected play. You know how a book and the puzzle and the memory game that we've, we've kind of created this little universe where a child can deep dive into and uh, that's something that we've really focused on because at an especially at an early childhood level children make connections all the time they don't mm -hmm. a book does not stay at a book you know when you read your child a story at bedtime the conversation gets repeated at the sand pit the characters come out and you know they're they're involved in the play-doh when their child is working with the play-doh and then they come out oh. with ego because that's how the way the child's brain works the more number of times that they get to apply it and they put it into different contexts it's how they make sense of it and that's what we're trying to create we're trying to create multiple touch points because it's not enough to have that one conversation it's not mm. enough to read that one book and put it back on the shelf and that's the point here the multiple touch points because at every different point so when you read the book then you play the puzzle and then there's some other thought that you kind of occurred and you're like hey you know that happened in the book but in the puzzle you know suddenly you're thinking about but why is the kathakali dancer like this and you know there's some other question that comes to mind and for children they need that they need the opportunity and the space to process to absorb and you know the the connections in the brain to be formed to have that conversation and take it forward so to speak so that they don't begin categorizing it in in a, at an early age and 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 putting it in a in a drawer chest that is only it's only appropriate to open that and and take it out in a certain context no you're breaking down those silos or those barriers right absolutely, Got absolutely because right now even if you see in a classroom right you'll have multicultural book day and that's when all the diversity books will come out Man. and then you put away for the rest of the year you know mm -hmm. and that's what we're trying to change that it shouldn't be one day in a year mm -hmm. right. it's, it's so funny it's funny that you say this because in, here in, in in the united states it's the month of february which also happens to be the shortest month of the calendar year uh, is uh, is reserved for what they call here in, in the united states black history month so today is the first day of black history month so it's it's interesting i, I never understood this concept right so i'm i'm an immigrant to this country you say so you're talking about african american history for one month and the other 11 months you don't talk about it so it, and it's you also pick the shortest month to talk about. Interesting. So it, it's a compartmentalization that I, I still haven't fully understood what the what the reasoning behind that was, or what the what the what the actual benefit of that potentially could be. But um, that, that's not what we're here to discuss. Um, but I thought that was an interesting parallel between what you just yeah. said and what's going Absolutely. on here in this side of the world. And I, and I think that's because at an adult level, it's hard. You know, change doesn't happen immediately, right? It's a very slow, organic change. I mean, it's only now that we're talking about it, right? It's only now with Black Lives Matter and things like that, people are, you know, voicing themselves. They're using social media. They're using their platforms to kind of raise awareness, etc. And it's all happening at a very adult level. Now, what we're trying to say is that we don't need to wait till then. And the fact is that children do not form biases. We pass on our biases to our children. Our children are born with a clean slate. They don't need a multicultural book month. They don't need a specific month to learn about something. If this is what they know, then this is what they grow up with. Right. Right. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. You could be, you know, an Indian immigrant growing up in Germany. But as far as the Indian child is concerned, I'm German because that's all I know. Mm. So it's, it's literally what they grow up with. And 
that's what we're trying to say that you know let's raise them in a way that they're they have access to everything and they have access to all conversation all kinds of people all kinds of content and that will shape them to be better more empathetic human beings let's raise them to learn what it's like to be themselves but also how to put themselves in other people's shoes mm. I, I love your passion about this, Akila, um, because it. I think it takes it takes not only somebody who is a a spokesperson for the company they helped start, but it, people don't buy your product; they buy your passion, right? And and I'm 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 suspecting that Trauma, your partner, is is no less passionate about it. So how, how have you? How have your, uh, I mean, how, how long has this been around and, and what's been the success so far? So we started in uh, March of 2019. Um, so we've been about, it's almost two years now. Uh, it's for us, um, we're, we're a small company, we're growing pretty quickly, but it, it's taken off really, really well. Uh, we've been both uh, humbled and amazed by uh, the outpouring of love that we've received uh, across the world. Uh, we've had, I mean, of course, from the Indian diaspora as well, because that's our lar largest audience at this point. Uh, but we've also had people like, there was an Italian lady who bought our books because you know, she just said that the message in them and uh, the way in which they came across, it just, yeah, she, um, so we asked her actually, you know, why did you buy our books? And she's like, things made with love reach all the hearts of the world. And she said it in oh, Italian. Um, nah. You know, and for us, uh, for me especially, I was just like, I was blown away by that because, you know, that's exactly what we're trying to do. It's, 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 you're trying to create impact. And um, if, if we can, you know, that one little child whose perspective we can change, that one family that we can, you know help and uh you know create that impact that's that's all we're looking for so well you gave us a key you, you you gave us a prompt you, you reminded me to ask our audience because you said you have customers in italy so let's ask our audience whether you're watching this live or the recording let everybody know where in the world you are watching this from and i want to give a shout out to one commenter here I'm not quite sure yet where Dmitri is located, but I, he says Russia, so I'm suspecting he might be Russian. Um, not really sure where in the world Dmitri is located, but hey, I want to give a shout out to everyone watching and commenting, and he found Black History Month um, <laughs> weird. I'm saying weird, but he he found it hard to grasp. All right, all right. Thanks, Dmitri. So New York, all right, a Russian in New York, <laughs> and we have an Austrian in Canada. Esther, thanks for watching. Excellent, excellent. Thanks everybody. Just type it in where in the world you're from and or where you're watching from. Either way, you can type in both where you're from and where you're watching from. That might be two different locations. Now I. Um, I heard you mention the Indian diaspora uh, several times, Akila. Um, and many of our audience members might be aware of this, but I don't want to take that for granted. So when you say the Indian diaspora, how big is it and what should we know about it? So, well, I mean, a diaspora is nothing but Indians who are not living in India, right? So it's Indians who might have moved out for work. It might be second generation Indian origin uh, people, second generation, third generation Indians. Uh, so it's a, I mean, if you consider that there are 1 billion Indians in the world, uh, it's a pretty large size of population that's not living in India. Um, yeah. You know, it goes into the millions. So yeah, uh, it's, it's a pretty big uh, chunk. Um, I think that we're the largest diaspora in the world. So, the Indians Actually, and the Chinese. I, I, I should have researched the numbers. I wouldn't know. I couldn't that, tell you. That, but that, would, that would also be obvious in terms of the population. So, so mm -hmm. India and China. Yeah. Shouldn't be that hard to to get that many people out if you have so many in your in your own borders. Um, you also mentioned a couple of times contemporary and present day India. 
And that, that brings me to something that I only know very little about, that I read a lot about, and, and, and that came out through conversations I had with other facilitators in our field, but also with clients that either worked and lived in India or are from India, that the, uh, the last, let's say, 10, 20 years have seen a significant generational shift almost it's not like there's i mean there's generational shifts happening with every generation but that the that the sense of identity what it means to be indian in the 21st century for a broad base of well educated um, younger people let's say millennial generation or now the z's even they may have a different self image of what being indian or being from india what that means to them compared to the more you you said folklore earlier the old fashioned type of cultural markers of india um is that something that i'm seeing through my western lenses or is this actually happening so i think that india like any other uh, old culture or old um you know, civilization, there's been a lot of change that has happened in um, in the cities, right? Especially urban cities. And what happens is that, so our cultural context has also evolved mm. as such uh, with liberalization, with, you know, development, um, you know, Netflix, HBO, all streaming in, you know, there's, there is a change in cultural context uh, in India. And so I think what tends to happen is that when you haven't visited India for a while, especially if you're living abroad or if you're a foreigner, your image of what India is tends to be based on, say, a slumdog millionaire, Right, and that's not necessarily an accurate representation. It may be one. Is, is White Tiger is White Tiger better? Do we need to watch White Tiger instead? Yeah. Again, again these are all these are all one part of it. They're not right. part of it, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think and I think that's and that's true of any culture. And I think that's the problem that you will face no matter which part of the world you're in. With mm -hmm. any culture, there will always be a stereotypical. Uh, notion of what that culture is and how it's depicted in the outside world. And I think that's where, for us, we're trying to kind of break it down and we're saying, no, let's look at it from all aspects. So when we say we're contemporary, we're not only talking about the food, we're not only talking about the language, we're not only talking about the buildings and the uh, architecture or the art. It, it's everything, right? We touch upon everything. Obviously, again, it's not exhaustive. Uh, it, I don't think it's possible to be comprehensive about any culture, but it's about creating as many multiple touch points as you can and ensuring that the diversity of each culture is represented. Mm. Nice. So, Brett, I, I see a question coming up. Brett, say it. No, no, no. I just got to call out. Uh, there's a, a, a comment from Vali here who says it's a danger of a single story, right? Everybody, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there are multiple stories about this. So, the story you hear from one person is not necessarily the story that uh, exists for another. So, it's a, uh, yeah. So, where would where would people that live in the diaspora or where would people that are interested in exposing their children to materials that are uh, breaking down some of these single story narratives? Um, where do they find your product? So we're available on indigrokids.com. Um, we should have to have it here as an insert. <laughs> we, we ship globally to every part of the world uh, to date, except for Antarctica, we ship to every other continent. So, uh, yeah, we're easily available. Nice, nice, nice. And I, I would encourage everybody to check out their website um, just to get a feel for this and see how the um, the presentation of the product may already break down some of the stereotypes you may have had. And th This is what happened to me. This is actually why um, we're, we're talking with Akila here today because we found each other on LinkedIn and you you – introduced me to what you do and i was like okay but it's just a click away let's look at this my mind my internalized bias was expecting something quote unquote traditionally indian right yeah. and then i clicked on it like wait a second this website looks like it was built by a 25 year old canadian web developer and <laughs> it's 
very responsive and it is very current like okay this is not what i expected and, and the whole product presentation the way you talk about it um is did not did not feed the stereotype they were not strong but they were there was a little remnant of it in my mind like okay great so she's calling me out even though we hadn't even talked with each other yet and then when i talked to you um you kind of called me out again without without using those very words but i again was reminded that i expected a different communicative uh preference from you 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 the way you communicate with me or with us here uh, is some might say well very direct very open some might even say a little bit more western than i would have expected um and to me I, I, there's an old ted talk if, if you can find it on youtube or on ted.com as an old ted talk by david uh sivers and it, it's only it's less than three minutes long or less than four minutes so everybody in their in their lifetime has time to watch this and there's one sentence that I will never forget. He said, whatever you, whatever thing you might know about India, the opposite might also be true. And you remind me of that because whatever I thought was right about India or whatever I thought I really knew, knew, knew about India, there's an opposite that I hadn't encountered yet. So how do, you know, this is something big that I'm putting on you because I did a lot of cultural trainings last year that involved India. How do you resolve this kind of cognitive dissonance for people who are new to India that there might be different competing narratives coming from Indian culture? How, how, how do you resolve that? I know that's a big question, but I'm giving it a shot anyway. Um, so I think that as always, I mean, the way I would go about it is, um, and to me, uh, you know, I put my early childhood educator hat on because at best, I think adults are just like big people, right? Like, you know, it, it, it's not that much different. But um, what Especially I would say- for me. <laughs> <laughs> what I would say is that firstly, you know, um, dealing with any culture, Indian or otherwise, right? Um, the group does not speak you know, the individual does not speak for the group. The group does not speak for the individual, right? So you have to treat each person as an individual. Uh, I think that's first and foremost. Second is approach it with openness and curiosity. Um, I don't think that anybody feels bad when you ask questions, when it's coming from a place of, uh, you know, um, kindness and curiosity, you know? So it's okay to say, hey, you know, I, I don't quite understand what's going on. Could you explain this to me? How does this work, et cetera? Um, I think the minute you approach any interaction with openness and uh, you know this willingness to learn about the other person uh, and empathy, um, it automatically opens doors and you're able to kind of take that conversation forward. Um, and like I said, I you know, Life is gray everywhere across the world. You know, you're not, it, it's, you're, nobody comes in a standard box. You'll always get a bit of both. You'll get what they want you to see. They'll get, you'll get what, you know, uh, your own perceptions uh, might be confirmed. Sometimes it'll be completely thrown out of whack and they're both okay. So just open yourself up to the experience. I think that's, that's the word for it. You right. know, as long as you're open, everything else will fall into place. See, it's not just us saying this, the audience. There's <laughs> others who confirm our hunch. Oh, excellent. Thank you. We did not rehearse this. Thank you, Akila. <laughs> did I say exactly what you normally say? No, you said you said in your words, which are much more powerful than we could say it. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah, that was great. All right. So we know where to get it, IndieGrowKids.com. This is where you go check it out. Uh, we encourage you to do so, whether you're Indian, diaspora or not, doesn't matter. Um, there's also the Singapore product line that you want to check out. And who knows? Italy might be next, <laughs> going by the demand you, you outline. I, could, I, I have a handful of customers I could send your way for Italy product. <laughs> that would be fabulous. So, um, 
I just want to give you all a quick reminder. We talked about this last week, and we're doing this again this week. Brett and I are exploring and practicing on this new social media tool called Clubhouse. So join us for a chat on Wednesday, February 3rd. That's this week, Wednesday, at the times you see here, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, and very late in India. Um, but if you're... If you're going to be up very late in India, you could still join us if you so choose. We're going to talk about the business of culture and the culture of business, what this program is about. But we're going to do it in a more uh, open, conversive format. Just ask us anything and be surprised by the answers we might give you or not give you. So Clubhouse. Um, yes, it is still an Apple product only platform. I don't know when they're going to open it, so don't feel discriminated. It's not our exclusiveness, it's theirs. We're just using the tool as it is right now, and we're quite confident that it will blow up for other users as well in the near future. And find us on Wednesday. What else do we need to announce, Brett? That's it. I think um, we've got a, a week ahead of a more great guests and um, some tips uh, like we did last week, testing out this this way that we're uh, we're putting one particular topic and we're giving you re actual resources to take away and read. So it's coming up uh, as well this week. So, yeah. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. So, yep. Akila, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I, I know you. it's Get it getting late and we don't want to take too much more of your time and thank you for sharing your story this was amazing i, I love hearing thank from you so much. Thank all you for having the world. yeah excellent Wonderful. two chaps many cultures back again tomorrow we're out for now ciao ciao bye bye <laughs>